Hello ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to VUX World, the practical voice podcast. This episode of VUX World is brought to you by the Conversational Academy. I generally, this is genuine truth, I get asked all the time from people, where can I go to learn how to be a conversation designer? Or more specifically, where can I go to learn how to be a VUI designer, voice user interface designer? And There is very little out there by way of proper certified official training by, you know, active, competent designers. There is a couple out there uh, that I know of, but there's not very many. And one of the best out there is the Conversational Academy. It's brought to you by Robocopy and it's presented by Hans Van Dam. And we've had Hans Van Dam on the podcast previously. He's a super smart guy, absolutely incredibly knowledgeable. The course is really, really well put together, well delivered. It's all online. So you don't have to worry about, you know, getting to a certain location at a certain time. Anybody across the globe can do this at their own pace, at their own time and at their own convenience. It is well worth checking out. It takes you through the whole process of what it takes to be a conversation designer and trains you on every single aspect of conversation design. So whether you're looking to be a voice user interface designer or whether or not you're looking to be a chatbot designer, whether you're looking for some broad skills and a broad overview of what it takes to be a conversation designer. In fact, this is more than broad. It's, it's, it's incredibly detailed in the ins and outs and the complexities of it. It gets into supreme detail. It is definitely well worth checking out. If you're someone who's looking to move into this field, it's worth checking out. If you're already working in this field and you feel as though you could do with brushing up on your skills or to top your knowledge up and keep things current, then it's just as relevant for you as well. Check it out. The Conversational Academy, the link is in the show notes and it's also on the web page if you're on the website. Do check it out. On today's podcast, we are joined by Elaine Lee, who is the principal product designer at Twilio. She's working on the autopilot platform, which is Twilio's conversational uh, bot builder. You can build out any conversational experiences on there for Alexa and Google Assistant and even Facebook Messenger and chatbots and things like that. Uh, And it sounds like a really good tool. We get into some detail about the tool and and how it works and how you can design and build conversational experiences in there. Uh, And we also talk about uh, some of Elaine's previous experience and current experience as well in terms of building trust with dialogue you know people you know go back a couple of years and some people even right now don't necessarily trust chatbots to to be able to do the job that they're there for uh, so we talk about how we can build trust with people and, and and build relationships through the art of crafting dialogue it's an immense conversation you're gonna love it dustin is holding the reins for this one this is elaine lee on vux world VUX World. VUX World. VUX World. VUX World. VUX World. Branding with the big faces. I love listening to it. Kane Sims. Kane Sims. Kane Sims, the one and only. Britain's finest, Mr. Kane Sims. Dustin. Dustin. Dustin Coates. I like it when you guys are together and talking about boys. Without further ado, welcome to the show. Great. Kane, how are you doing? This is going to be a really good one this week. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm absolutely fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. This is an old colleague of yours we're speaking to today, Dustin. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the reasons why I'm really excited is uh, Lane and I used to work together at General Assembly and also really excited because where Elaine works now is a company that I've long admired and, uh, you know, I think has been long admired in the tech space. I remember when I was first learning uh, programming and being able to tap a button and have text messages appear on my phone was pretty, pretty magic. And so now seeing uh, Twilio branch out into that is is amazing and looking forward to hearing what Elaine has to say about that and about so much more in conversation design. Fantastic. Well, without further ado, Elaine Lee, welcome to VUX World. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and Dustin and I used to work together in New York at General Assembly, and I remember there was this one moment where I left a meeting and I never used the word submit again in my CTA. Do you remember this, Dustin? I don't uh, remember that <laughs> life-changing moment. Of yeah. You never used the it word submit? The way I write. Yeah, yeah. What, how do you mean? Dustin, Ex- what, what do you mean? Yeah, do you want to explain this? Yeah, I actually got this from an old boss of mine uh, who he always told me that submit just sounded like what robots do. Uh, And with these CTAs, with these calls to action on on websites or whatever, you really want to be clear 
about the language that you're using and what the user is actually doing. Whereas otherwise it's just like beep, boop, beep, bop, uh, submits <laughs> form. So that's for call to actions on buttons and stuff like that. Yeah, and, and I suppose it might apply to, to conversational things as well. So maybe we can we can go full circle here and tie it all. <laughs> yeah, word choices are definitely important. And even though I speak more like a robot in person, but through my designs and product, I'm trying to be less robotic, I guess. Yeah. And so, Elaine, you know, you when we were together at General Assembly, you were not doing conversational design. You were doing something completely different. How did you get to where you are today? Yeah, so back in 2015, uh, when I moved from New York back to the Bay Area, I joined a really small startup and we were working on a couple of different products. One of them was an office assistant bot. It was inside of Slack. And what we wanted to do was to help small teams automate their office. And Slack made perfect sense because that's where teams are. So we want to be where our users were. So that was the first launch of like me being into this space where I was doing a lot of work that I have never done before. Uh, what I was doing was like writing YAML scripts, simulating conversations, mapping out conversation flows. And it just was intimidating because I didn't know what I was doing. I was like, is this even design? But, you know, we were committed and we wanted to to do this. So I just went full force into the space and it kind of landed me at eBay building an AI first bot and then now at Twilio working on a platform for other people to build smart bots. What did e what, what was eBay all about then? I didn't realize eBay were, were doing much in the sort of conversational space. What, what was it that you were working on there? Yeah, so at eBay, I, I was part of this new product development team and I was there for about two and a half years or so primarily just working on an AI shopping assistant. So uh, originally it launched in Facebook Messenger. It was called eBay ShopBot. And then uh, for the past year or so, uh, we were in Google Assistant doing more of the voice space for shopping. And you mentioned that you're now at Twilio. What is Twilio all about? What is Twilio all about? <laughs> Twilio does a lot of different things, but then we're primarily a communications company uh, building platforms for developers. And the product that I'm working on is called Autopilot. And essentially it is a platform for people to build um, smart conversational bots that are voice or text-based and uh, being able to deploy it into different channels. And then does the Autopilot then tie into all of the other Twilio communications products? Yeah, there's definitely like uh, different products that you can use with Autopilot. For example, it's very easy for you to, as a developer or anyone building on the platform, to buy a number, a Twilio number, and hook it up to your bot that you're building inside of Autopilot. And then as well, we have um, a product called Flex that you can hook up Autopilot to Flex. And Flex is a contact center kind of management space where your agents can communicate with your end customers. So so uh, with Autopilot, you can do multiple things. You can just create a bot purely on, that stands alone, or you can also connect it to your own contact center or Flex. So that Flex, that's just to clarify, that's the contact center software where all the calls are routed and all that kind of stuff. Is that right? Yeah, that's mainly for, for example, uh, you would use that if you created a bot inside Autopilot or anywhere and you, at a certain point of the conversation, you want to hand off the human, your customers from a bot to an agent. And then, uh, so Flex is where all of the agents would be com conversing with your end customers. So it's human to human there. And Flex is, so... Once you've done that, I just want to get clear for, for people because I didn't realize uh, initially what kind of flex sort of was, but essentially it's like the, it's the, is it, would you describe it as the kind of central place where all customer contact comes through for uh, a contact center? Yes. So Twitter's yeah, in there, contact. Facebook's in there, escalated bot conversations are in there, all that kind of stuff. It, right? I would say it's more of like once, um, once you go through, say, like a bot kind of conversation or a system, and then you get routed to, you as a customer get routed to another 
human agent to talk to. So you're just talking one on one to the humans at that point, and you're outside of the whole um, autopilot scenario. Yeah, you're outside of the bot conversation. Now you're just in a conversation between you and the end user. You as a human, <laughs> and with your end user, that's a human. <laughs> yeah. And so, who is the core customer of Twilio and of Autopilot? Yeah, for Twilio, in general, uh, our customers are developers, and for Autopilot, and for myself, like the definition of a developer is pretty wide. Like it spans different roles and expertise level, and different types of developers, from independent developers to enterprise developers. And I guess like for myself, like as a designer, I hope to be building a platform that empowers just anyone to build an assistant um, with autopilot at Twilio. And uh, this is actually kind of interesting because I'm also curious of both of your definitions of what a developer is. Well, uh, do, do I duck out of that and throw it to the developer to kick us off? Kane, <laughs> well, I think you've already tipped your hand a little bit. Uh, I, would, I, would, hey. I would think a developer is somebody with the technical expertise to be able to uh, bring something about to actually create something that ends up being a production ready thing, whereas a designer would spec out what that looks like and how that how the interaction works. What do you think, Dustin? Yeah, I, I think I take a slightly different approach. So I'm not exactly answering your, your question, Elaine, but, you know, I, I think that there's developers perhaps and there's builders. And I think it's almost more important for people to be builders. Uh, and developers are going to be getting into the code a little bit more. But, uh, you know, it might also be drag and drop development. It might also be uh, using something like if this, then that. It could be tying uh, Airtable with you know, different APIs with Zapier, uh, that could be development as well. So uh, in a lot of ways, I'm thinking this through as I'm talking, but uh, it's ultimately people who can build stuff, I think. What would your definition be, Lynn? Yeah, I, I agree with what Dustin is saying regarding uh, builders and people who want to make things. And for for people who want to make things and don't necessarily call themselves developers, they shouldn't feel that uh, this platform isn't for them. Uh, right now, the platform is a little bit more code heavy, but I believe that, you know, if you want to build something, uh, we should be able to empower you in however we can to, to do that. And for building bots, like you see multiple different kind of roles in play here uh, at, you know, working at eBay, working at enterprise and even a startup. Well, what, at a startup, I was doing everything that I didn't even think was design. But, you know, at eBay, it was a little bit more structured where I was a design lead and we had like engineers working on this as well. Uh, and you also have content strategists, you have a growth team, you have different types of roles that want to affect maybe the conversation in the bot or how the experience is like. And everyone should be able to have their say and influence how the experience is. So I know like traditionally the word developer is leaning more towards someone who knows how to code, but I'm hoping that we can expand that a little bit to more of like a builder as well. That's just, yeah, that's my personal opinion. So does Autopilot then, is that a tool or a platform, whether it's a tool or a platform, I don't know, but you can maybe just explain that. But is it something that can be used independent of the rest of the Twilio ecosystem for anybody to create conversational experiences on? Or is the intention of that that it's a bot builder that works with the Twilio ecosystem? Yeah, so uh, you can use Autopilot without using any of the other Twilio products. Like you don't necessarily need to get a number from Twilio or hand off to Flex. Essentially, you can build a bot on Autopilot and then put it into any kind of platform that you want. Uh, right now, like you can put it into Facebook Messenger or Google Assistant um, and WhatsApp, and as well as just like doing voice and SMS. When would somebody then, let's say they're not using the rest of the Twilio platform, when would they use Autopilot specifically versus uh, another NLP or even if I'm building a, an assistant action or an Alexa skill, when would I go to Autopilot? Yeah, I think the main purpose of uh, someone coming to Autopilot is being able to build 
the product, the build your experience once and then being able to deploy it into a couple of different channels that you want. And Autopilot is in beta right now, so it's still a pretty young product, but uh, it'll be a little bit more robust throughout the year and to come. Yeah. And are you are you working on the Autopilot product as in your role is to design and work to build out Autopilot as a product? Or are you working within Autopilot creating conversational experiences for Twilio clients? Mm, great question. Right now, I am primarily working on building out the platform so that people can build bots on top of it. Yeah. And... I would love to get more into more of the conversational design and then bring back like all the things that I've learned from both at the startup and at eBay of how conversations can go and have that be more a part of the platform, uh, especially just to like a guide of what kind of structure do we need and you know when you're creating a a bot. So in, instead of just creating a platform for people to build bots, like with all the building blocks and trying to see if I can bring back some of my past experiences in guiding the conversation. And I know you can't speak about specific customers, but can you talk about some of the things that people are building on top of autopilot today? Yeah, so a lot of enterprise clients would want to use autopilot uh, for anything from simple like uh, one off conversations to doing something a little bit more robust of like ordering uh, or getting auto insurance, um, ordering flowers, for example, and things like that. Yeah. And so maybe can you walk us through how a customer would use autopilot? Let's say they decide to start working with autopilot. They want to build out their first bot. What's the, what are the steps that they need to take to get there? Yeah, for sure. So the backbone of autopilot right now is you would go in there, create a bot, you know, essentially name your bot. And then inside the bot, you create task. And with the task, you do a, basically two main things with the task. You can program it and then you can train it. And what programming does is that you essentially tell the task like this is what the, how the task will act. So once that task is triggered, the bot knows what to do. And then training it is essentially using uh, samples and utterances from the end users that you anticipate they would be saying or that information is coming through your call logs. For example, you can change it like convert that into samples to train the bot to understand that, you know, if you hear, if the bot hears these phrases, then trigger this task. But, you know, not all tasks needs um, training, for example, because some tasks are just uh, routed from a different task. So uh, essentially, yes, uh, you create tasks, you have program tasks, and then you have the training tasks. And what we currently do for the programming tasks to help you just jumpstart the experience is that we have something called autopilot actions. And they are actions that you can use right out of the box. So for example, uh, in your JSON code, you can say, or you can you, uh, type in the word say and write down like what you want the bot to say wh when that task is hit. Or there are some other actions called collect. And then collect is where you would uh, be able to ask your end users a couple of different questions, save the answers from them. And also if you wanted to have like validations after each of those um, questions, then it can validate that, oh, this is a input that you know the bot recognizes and wants to accept or or it doesn't and then asks you to basically say in a different way or repeat your answer and um, another one that we have is like listen listen is quite important because without listening the bot you know it, it's essentially it's a dead end so <laughs> remember to have listen after you ask a question or say something unless you want the conversation to end like if someone said goodbye and then your bot repeats uh, or says back okay bye see you next time or whatever it is uh, then you don't necessarily need a listen because that's when um, the conversation kind of ends and um, yeah there are a few more other actions that you can use right off the bat and as well as like uh, we started writing some templates inside of each of the actions so that, you know, just to get you started with um, having different types of conversations. Are those things, um, when you say say and listen and collect, 
Uh, what you're describing there, are you describing the kind of code that you would use when you're creating something? So you would use the say thing when you're expecting a user to say something, and then the listen thing when, oh, sorry, the listen thing when you're expecting the user to say something to you, and then the say thing when you expect when you want to say something to the user. Is, is this kind of, are you describing here, are you describing like tags within the code to structure out what you want the thing to do? Yes, exactly. So then this this is essentially what the bot is doing. Yeah. So say is what the uh, bot is saying. And then listen is like you're telling the bot, okay, now listen, listen for an input or a response from the user. And then whatever it listens to uh, selectively or just like in general, then uh, we would be able to help understand that input, hopefully, and then route the user to the next task or the appropriate task if if there is um, a trigger or if you train the task to like listen to those phrases. And is a task the equivalent of like an intent? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And so this JSON that you're mentioning there, is this something that your customer is going to configure at the very beginning and just send you in a, a long JSON configuration? Or is this something that they need to code up and send back and forth uh, to Twilio on an event-driven basis? Yeah, you can actually do both. Like right now in our, in, in our platform, uh, you can actually just copy and paste some of our templates into the code editor that we have within the platform and just start morphing the changing the conversation there or you can uh, use your own json and then put it back in i'm just trying to wrap my head up because it sounds as though there's something similar i'm just trying to kind of gather it in my head so i can sort of relate to it and compare it to something that i'm kind of familiar with because it sounds as though it's um created in a slightly different way is it is the uh, autopilot if you're going to create something in there, is there a, like a, a interface that you would go to, like similar to like Dialogflow or the Alexa Skills Kit, like a back end interface where you can do all that kind of work within there, or is it a case of having to kind of code up JSON files and and upload them onto a server or something like that? Is is there kind of like an interface where you can go to to create stuff? Yes, for sure. Yeah, the the whole idea is that you come to um, Twilio on and use the autopilot uh, interface inside of Twilio's platform, and you can do everything in there. You don't necessarily need to uh, leave Twilio to do code on your own and then port it back in, but you can if you want to. But the idea is that you would just build the bot within the interface. Yeah, and then what skill level? You, you talked a little bit about this earlier, but... Uh, how much do people need to know about natural language processing or even conversational best practices today to start using autopilot? Or are there tools that Twilio provides to make it easier for someone who isn't as familiar? Yeah, currently, currently uh, our documentation has like basically the whole steps of how you would be able to uh, build a bot on the platform. And like I kind of mentioned, autopilot is a pretty young product, it's in beta, so then we're doing a lot of like iterations and new improvements to it. So uh, my idea right now is that, you know, this is a little bit more heavier on the code side, but um, we are trying to give the users like more features for them to be able to build things without digging too much into the documentation or really understanding how natural language processing works um, on their own. So you'll be seeing a lot more improvements where there's a lot more guidance and understanding uh, for, for anyone of any kind of expertise level in development to be able to use the platform. And these thing, the the actions that you'd mentioned, the the say, listen, collect, hand off, and remember, are those? Is it a case of that's what the platform provides, and you can swap and change and use those to your heart's content, and and that and that's you you get what you're given, or is it that you mentioned that you know it's a bit code heavy? Is it a case of you being able to through doing a bit of development and some coding build other functionality or capability? into it or do you, do you do you have to use one of those five um actions at the moment at the moment like we offer these actions for you to use but then you're able to like uh, build it however you want as well but like the idea of these actions so that you don't have to build them yourself like you can just use a listen uh the listen tag and you don't need to uh, worry about like if the bot is actually listening or not yeah and with those 
the training part. You said there was a task, then a training. The training is that um, you mentioned about creating kind of utterances and all that kind of stuff. Is that what you need to do? Is similar to creating an action or a skill? You need to provide, you know, as many kind of sample utterances as you possibly can. Uh, is that what the training part is? Just coming up with all of those sample utterances and and running that through autopilot. Yeah, exactly. So the training would uh, encompasses like two sides. Like one would be all the sample ut- utterances that you mentioned, and then also something we call fields, which are also equivalent to what you might hear of, like slots, for example. So if I'm a Twilio customer and I'm using Twilio already and, and just starting with autopilot, can I use the the things that my customers are saying through? the text messaging that I have set up on Twilio or the the call center that I have set up on Twilio to jumpstart my autopilot? Uh, got it. So uh, essentially all the data that you have, the conversations that you already have from text messages from your end customers, as well as like content, uh, contact center logs, like call logs and things like that. Yeah, that's definitely helpful for you to really train your bot and be able to um, just like you said, jumpstart the whole process because I think having those samples and ta- uh, those samples are hard to come by. So <laughs> you would get if you have them from your company already, a whole log of it. You already have so much data that can start training all the different tasks, not just like one task. You potentially have tens and twenty tasks that uh, your bot can fulfill just from the data that you re- currently have. So I would say like that's also a great way of looking at like what kind of automated experience should I be building for I mean should like this company or my company be building uh, based off of all the different things that people are already saying to you know to um, your contact center or through like messages that you have with them and seeing where there's like, I guess, an influx of maybe questions that people might be having or certain types of tasks that they're having. And then seeing if you can start to automate some of that, if that's the, the purpose of you having a bot. And so maybe changing topics a little bit. When we were planning for this podcast, one of the ideas that you mentioned was the idea of building trust with dialogue and how people can go about doing that. Obviously, you have a lot of experience at Twilio, at eBay and before uh, building these experiences. So what would you say if people want to build trust through dialogue in these conversational settings, how would they go about doing it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I believe that every moment that your your bot has with the end user, the, every kind of interaction is an opportunity to build trust between your bot and humans. And why I care about this is because I believe like this is what will increase engagement and repeat usage. And uh, someone coming in, testing out your bot, a lot of times like people are just kind of poking around, trying to figure out what does this bot even do? And I believe like when, you know, a few years ago when a lot of people were developing bots, uh, a lot of the end users don't necessarily know why or what to do with certain bots, but then I, I think there is a lot of letdown. And because of that, uh, bots and like AI assistants have a little bit of a bad reputation at that time of like, oh, it's not quite smart and, you know, all bots are dumb and things like that. But I think it really kind of comes down to like setting up the right expectation. First at the product level, like why are we doing a voice bot? Why are we doing a conversational chat bot? And uh, what, like who, who is the competition? The competition might not necessarily be other voice bots and chat bots. The competition is perhaps the status quo of how people are currently behaving, what they are currently using. So for example, what they're doing on their apps and their phones and uh, their like desktop already and websites and things like that, or how they just uh, do go about their life workflow, I would say. So uh, how do you, how do you break into their pattern and change the behavior of like, oh yeah, talk to the spot instead to get these things done. So um, I will always like, like to first like focus on why voice, like why why a chatbot is this better than the current experiences out there right now that are non-voice, 
or non-chat experience? And if it's not, like, how is this complementary to what exists right now? And making sure that it actually brings value to your end users uh, versus just uh, perhaps building a bot just for building a bot sick. Uh, I mean, I think like there's a lot of value in experimenting and learning from that as well. But for just talking about like how to increase increase engagement, like we first need to build a lot of trust between the bot and the end user. Well, how do you set those expectations you know when someone is do you set the expectations before they actually arrive so for example if you're promoting an alexa skill for example is it at that point during through your promotional channels that you set the expectations is it when someone arrives into the skill or the action or wherever they are where do you set the expectations and how do you go about setting those expectations yeah, I think at every every opportunity you have to communicate your bot to the end user. So then, yeah, so it, it can start with uh, just what is the description for your skill? And if you're using any type of um, ads outside, like through social media, what is the messaging there? Like, what is the actual value pop? I, I think, like, in the end, uh, your, your bot is still trying to solve a human problem or issue or something that people want. So keep focusing on that. Uh, less so, I, I believe, like less so on, yeah, talk to our bot. <laughs> like let's focus on on the technical bot aspect of it, but then more of like thinking of uh, just like any kind of advertising of like, uh, what are the human problems that we can solve? Like, so starting with that and just kind of being pretty transparent of what you your you can offer as a business uh, through this channel. So for example, if you're an e-commerce uh, company, but then your bot can only handle a certain vertical, uh, stick to that vertical and find customers that you know, are interested in that vertical and then build your experience out where it is uh, as you know clean and simple and create this quote, happy path as possible, getting people through uh, the conversion funnel, and then build that out to test out how that is before expanding to other verticals, for example. Because it's harder to just like try to handle everything where you're just a little bit good at everything and it doesn't necessarily offer value for like a strong set of customers. There's presumably more expectations to manage in there, though, isn't there? It's, it's, it's a challenge in terms of folks. That's, that's always a recommendation, isn't it? Folks, crawl before you can walk. Focus on doing one thing really well, then expand it once you've got that kind of boxed off. But I think that that's probably where the expectation setting needs to happen, isn't it? Because if you've got something, if you're a brand that does a lot of stuff and you release a, a voice experience that does one specific thing, you're going to be dealing with a whole load of people coming to the brand expecting to be able to do all of that whole other stuff. Let's say, for example, you're a bank, you do mortgages, you do loans, you do balance transfers, you do savings accounts, but the skill or the action or the voice experience or the bot that you've created will only allow people to check the balance and transfer money. So if people come to it expecting to be able to do everything that they can do with their bank, but you only provide a certain... Um, a, a narrow piece of functionality although you do it really well then you potentially you kind of the expectation is it right in that the expectation might be that you can do everything but then when they get there you can only do a, a, a narrow amount of things so you aren't you inevitably going to let some people down does that make sense yeah for sure for sure so I, I think that's why like targeting the right kind of customers for that vertical and just uh, being explicit about it before they even come to to the bot uh, would be important and then but then also some people would have just like kind of dug around and heard about your bot uh, expecting that it can do a lot of different things because it's like a household name and when it uh, invokes your your bot, say like, it's like, hey, Google, let me talk to this like sneaker bot or whatever it is. Uh, in this moment of say the greeting, I mean, I like to break it down into a couple of different moments. Like I have uh, five moments, starting with 
greeting as a moment number one. And that's where you can first like set the right expectation of the bot's capability and basically the rules of engagement of like, okay, this is what m me as a bot can do really well. And uh, do you want to move forward with this kind of experience? And basically having like small steps to guide the users from uh, the top of the funnel to the bottom. Yeah. So yeah, I, I would say like, uh, the five moments that I kind of list out would be moment number one would be greeting, two would be listening, three would be echo back, four is like response results, and then five would be the errors and fallbacks and reprompts are all the moments that uh, you can start building trust between the bot and the end user. And can you tell us a little more about those? Uh, the greeting you just mentioned is this was what I can do uh, and then building the trust there. What are listening, echo back, and uh, maybe start off with the listening and we can just go through them because they sound really interesting here. Yeah, so then I started off with the first moment of greeting. Once the user comes to your bot, you set the right expectation of what it can do. And then listening is essentially what the bot is listening for. So we talked a lot about like in general about how, you know, we want to figure out how the bot will respond to people, its tone and its voice. But then what's also just as it as important is what it is listening to and everything that it's going to anticipate that will go wrong or go off of, you know, the, the path that it wants you to be in. So, and um, basically having a response for any type of those kind of situations. So be prepared for things like someone wanting to change the mission. Maybe they were asking for this one thing X and then they, say something else and basically is changing the mission from X to Y. And then also asking for things that maybe your bot does not support right now. Maybe if it's a banking bot, uh, it, it can only check your balances, but you want it to pay your credit card and uh, be able to anticipate that people might ask you for these things that because uh, by nature of like you being a banking bot, you should be able to um, let me pay my credit card and then, but you know, if someone asks for that and you don't support that yet, be able to respond to that and give them a way to that path, still offer them value. And also things like chit chat and profanity, negative and positive feedback, things that are not necessarily part of what you thought, you know, necessarily people would do with your bot as like a banking bot or a shopping bot, but then be able to like think, oh yeah, people might say these things and how would you have a response for it? So the idea is to uh, listen, and this is something to be just prepared for anything that might happen. So is that is that then um, the concept of, of listen is to preempt what people might be asking for that you might not be able to do right now, understanding when people might be changing tasks and being able to cope with that. Is that something that you would do at the kind of design and development phase or is that something that you would do once you've kind of launched something or is it kind of a bit of, bit of both? Yeah, I, I guess it kind of depends on uh, how fast you want to launch your product and put it out there. Because <laughs> like, when I was working at a startup, so we were just literally just learning as things come through uh, at eBay at a bigger company, I had a little bit more resource and time for me to actually map out all of this. But I didn't really mentally think about all of this until I actually had the experience as uh, at the startup where I was, you know, all of us humans were essentially agents behind the bot and we were seeing conversations come through. We were tackling conversations. So with that experience, I know that sometimes people would change missions. I know that they would ask for things that we actually don't want to give them or, or can't support. And then I know of like, yeah, they're going to want to have chit chat. And we're like, oh, well, we are here to, you know, automate your office, not necessarily to have like a friendly conversation about anything random. So I've seen some of these scenarios and it kind of gave me an insight of like, okay, remember to 
plan out, anticipate for these buckets of conversation, and how would we di- redirect the conversation to uh, to what your bot offers? So, for example, going back to the banking situation, if that's the value of the bot, like how do we redirect the conversation back to uh, what the bot is good at, which is like perhaps checking your balance. And then uh, the echo back step. What is this? Yeah, so echo back. So after you, uh, as a bot, says something to the user and then the user says something, um, echo back is essentially trying to acknowledge that it heard what the user said. So not just like a generic acknowledge, like, okay, but then more so of like repeating back maybe a couple of the key elements that the user said. Uh, just to show that you were listening, but it also kind of helps them think of like, oh, did the bot actually heard me correctly? And then with the echo back uh, follows the the fourth moment that I was mentioning is like say response and results. So echo back and also in the response, uh, they're all about trying to give transparency into why the bot is now going to respond with what it is going to say or what it's going to offer you. So uh, it's essentially giving you reasons why you should trust the results. Um, So for example, of a shopping bot, maybe you ask for something like uh, a pair of, uh, let me see, Nike Blazer Mid-77. And the bot might respond with, okay, there are three colors for Nike Blazer Mid-77 basically echoing back uh, what you said. And it says like uh, red, green, and blue. Um, Which color are you looking for? And essentially, uh, maybe I might say, it doesn't matter. And then the bot can say, okay, I've looked through 48 results and the best price is $110 for the Habanero red version. Want me to check if this is in your size. So where what I just said there now is that the um, I as a bot looked through 48 results. So I'm trying to tell you, like, how did I come up with $110 as the best price? Like, I actually did some work trying to put a little bit more insight of like, why am I showing you this uh, number? Why, how did I come up with this number? Because a lot of times people will double check the bot's work. They would do it (laughs) just to see if they can even trust the results that are coming back. And uh, and then once they check that on their own, then they realize that, okay, I can trust what the bot is saying. So hopefully eventually that will build the trust between the bot and the human. And then the human does not necessarily need to go and do that work on themselves. It sounds as though people might not necessarily be trusting these bots a great deal. Is that, is that the vibe that you, that you get from the work that you've done is that people don't, don't always trust uh, the information that they're getting through, through these things. When I first started, that was in like 2015. Uh, So at that time, I think there weren't a lot of, bots out there that are doing a lot of like transactional um, transactional things where you're actually paying the bot <laughs> for something that it found. I think whenever there's money involved, people are just a little bit more, you know, safe about that. I was like, okay, let me make sure, is this really the best price? Like what, and uh, uh, what kind of, you know, what kind of basically uh, fine lines are there, are there like extra fees and things like that. So uh, we can, you know, we saw information coming through, like I'll just use the example of when I was at the startup, people were asking like, what's the catch here? Like, why are you like doing this work for me? Do I need to pay a subscription? Is there like an extra fee at the end, et cetera? And there wasn't, but like they wanted to see if uh, what what we were coming back with them is, is like, you know, if there's like an extra cost or if it's the same cost as if they did the work themselves. And uh, so from that kind of insight, like we kind of knew that, you know, people aren't just going to trust necessarily at that time, like what you're telling, uh, what, you know, bots are telling them, like, yeah, you should buy this. So I was like, why should I buy this? <laughs> like, how do I know that, you know, you actually did the work for me? I think, like, this is already pretty far down the funnel of, you know, from the greeting all the way to, like, the results. And then because it's, like, probably another step before you would purchase the item. So then that's usually the step in any kind of purchase flow. You know, even if you're doing the work yourselves online, you're trying to think, like, oh, should I buy this or not? And, uh, 
let me look for a promo code. You're, you're going to check your own work too and make sure like you yourself found the best price. So, uh, so yeah, like if the bot can be a little bit more transparent to tell you like, why did I give you this um, offer? Why did I give you this result? Uh, then it would slowly build some more trust. In your experience, is there more trust given to these bots when, you know, you've worked in startups, you've worked at very, very large companies. Uh, has there been more trust when it's the large company versus the startup? Is there more trust today now that conversational is more mainstream than it was when you were first doing this in 2015? Or has it stayed pretty static over the time? I, I feel like... Now more people are used to the idea of bot. They probably have played with some sort of voice bot or chat bot before and then all the speaker devices. So then it's a little bit uh, more available than before. Like before, when I was at a startup, our bot was only in Slack and it was geared towards a specific target, which are um which are teams on Slack. And then typically the teams on Slack are a little bit more tech savvy just because they were also in San Francisco and then working at a tech company and they're in Slack. So then they're more willing to uh, test out and play with something like a bot. Um, and I, I think like now people are more, are at least more aware of it. And they probably have experienced a lot of bots that don't really do, you know, too deep of a flow or anything a little bit too valuable uh, for them. So then that also like brings down the credibility of bots. But this is where that's why I feel like uh, every single little baby step to build the trust back up would be crucial. And I don't necessarily have too much insight on, you know, if um, if the work at a startup versus a work at a big corporate company increase the probability of someone converting or using. But what I did see is that uh, through both of those experiences is what I was kind of mentioning of trying to build trust at every single moment that you can. And um, because at, when we were working on the office assistant bot, we started seeing repeat engagement. Uh, it was absolutely after people checked our work. It was like, why, why are you offering me this? Like, why are you finding, you know, basically doing the work for me? What is the catch? And once they realized like, yeah, the, the price that we're giving them is the same price that they would find themselves. Then they started trusting like um, the way that we were operating. But I would also say that uh, the difference also is an office assistant bot versus the eBay shopping bot it's quite different because for eBay, people are shopping for personal items a lot of the times. And personal items are really hard to, to shop for, even if like as a person looking on a site. But if you're shopping for an office, there's a little bit more of like a general um, okay on like, yeah, you're shopping for 40 people, 50 people. So you don't necessarily need every single person's buy-in before purchasing something for the office. So there's also a difference of like something that's a little bit more of a commodity or repeat purchases and something that is like quite personal where you might dig a little bit deeper. There's obviously, there's also, um, you know, that's that's building trust in a, in a commerce setting, but also even trusting the information that, that's been provided you know i think that's what you, your example just then of you know <clears throat> excuse me here's some trainers i've found by using the information that you've given and then making some assumptions and here's how i've worked it out and here's the best trainers uh, I'm a, you know alexa and google assistant do something very similar even just with a simple search they'll say something like here's something from wikipedia so they'll give you the source to kind of establish where they've found the information from. And then, you know, it's almost like framing the next thing they're going to say. So it's like, here's something from Wikipedia, you know Wikipedia, you trust Wikipedia, so what I'm about to say, you can trust and you can rely on sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. So I think, we do we have one more step left for that process? 
Yeah, my last one is uh, just moment number five. <laughs> it's just errors, fallbacks, and reprompts. And then there are, uh, we kind of touched on this a little bit. I mean, there are two types of errors I would like to bucket them into. Uh, one would be like bot errors and how does it respond to what it doesn't know as well as like what it, you know, what it doesn't support and also what it wants to ignore. Sometimes I do think that it is okay to ignore things <laughs> if like there is like potential abuse or anything like that. I, uh, I feel like, yeah, moments of pauses and, and ignoring certain types of conversation is okay. Just like any humans might want to like ignore a bully that's like bugging them. So, uh, so there's like bot errors and then also human errors. So uh, human errors could be anything like um, the bot didn't do anything necessarily erroneous or wrong, but then maybe I as a human, I just didn't hear uh, what the bot just said because I maybe I moved away from the space or there was a loud truck coming by so I basically didn't hear so I might say back to the bots like sorry uh, can you repeat that I, I didn't hear what you said and then remembering to write in um, uh, training and conversations of like okay the bot needs to recognize that someone might not actually hear what I just said and want me to repeat it and be sure to be able to answer that otherwise then you know you you kind of just lost the person there when you were doing so well and <laughs> you just lost the person there yeah great uh, anything else uh, on your side Kane? I don't think so. No, this has been this has been absolutely unbelievable. Is there anything from your side, Elaine? Anything we haven't touched on? Any other things that uh, that you think would be interesting? Yeah, I think this is this is absolutely like fun, and I'm also curious of like what you've seen in your work of like how do people or how do bots like build trust between uh, itself and and users or any of your thoughts around that? What do you think, Kane? Uh, it's interesting. I think one of the things that uh, the two big platforms have that that uh, others won't in other channels potentially is that people typically, well, some people, depending on on um, how you kind of perceive privacy and whatnot, but a lot of people trust your likes of Google and Amazon anyway, don't they? A lot of people use Google Search every day. A lot of people shop on Amazon. So maybe it's those two platforms in particular have got trust almost built in haven't they you know another example on the on the google home hub not putting a camera in there showing that they're caring about kind of privacy kind of thing there's little things like that that can help i think probably build trust but in terms of the the um the skills and actions and bots that, that i've seen in particular i can't think of any specific examples of, of who's doing a good job i don't know what your thoughts are justin it's funny that you mentioned that people trust uh, amazon and google because uh, you know uh, Elaine, you might be saying this, that people are coming to Twilio. You know, I see this in my day job. Uh, people in companies are afraid of Google and Amazon. Uh, you've got Walmart, for example, is partnering with Google because they're afraid of Amazon. Uh, lots of people are afraid of Amazon because they just move into everything. Uh, so maybe the end users are certainly trustful of these, these platforms, but the companies certainly seem to be scared. And I think ultimately, in my opinion, or in my experience at least, how you know bot builders develop trust is by being really good at it. Uh, if you can serve the user's needs, ultimately, that's where the trust is going to come from. It could be you know a, a dry response. There could be no personality. It could be just uh, you know no recorded audio. We've talked about recorded audio is interesting, but at the end of the day, if you can't connect me with what I'm looking for or connect me with what I want, then the trust is going to go away. Go away. If you can connect me with it, I, I'm willing to use a command line to, to do a lot of stuff. And that's not going to be a great experience, but it connects me with what I want. And that, I think, ultimately is what anybody needs to do. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. It's like definitely focusing on what is the user value add that that uh, this um, this experience or this bot is giving because it's not so much about you know just being a automated conversational bot sounding a little bit like a human a little bit not but it's really at the end of the day like uh, is this solving someone's problem and why did they even come to the bot in the first place so yeah so I, I think like this is just a 
a channel, a tool, and still need to really focus on what the user ad is. And so, Elaine, where can people find Twilio Autopilot? Where can people find you online if they want to learn more? Yeah, you can find Twilio Autopilot through just our Twilio site. And uh, there will be a little bot icon that you can find Autopilot. And for myself, like you can definitely find me on LinkedIn. And I wrote some pieces in the past on Medium regarding just me designing in the space. And there's a little bit more insight in there as well. Thank you so much, Elaine, for joining us today. It's, it's really been a blast. Yeah, thank you so much. That's it, and Kane. That was Elaine Lee of Twilio. Sounds like a really good platform, Autopilot. I wasn't, I wasn't aware going into the conversation that Autopilot could be used as a complete standalone tool to build conversational experiences in. I kind of, I thought it was part of the Twilio ecosystem, and you had to have the other Twilio products to be able to get any benefit out of it. But that's not the case. So you can use that as a tool to build conversational experiences in. So go ahead and check that out. It sounds sounds really simple to be fair i know elaine mentioned there's a lot of you know coding involved at the moment very code heavy right now but um it sounds as though the building blocks are there to create something that that you know anybody can use with uh, without the real need for coding i mean the, the actions sound fairly straightforward you know the say listen collect hand off and remember it sounds as though the the framework is a uh, Simple enough to be easy to understand, but flexible enough to be able to create something fairly, fairly advanced. Um, so yeah, sounds really good. And also, you know, I, I like the fact that that Elaine is approaching conversation design and dialogue design from a point of view of building trust. And you know, that is one thing that uh, I mean, Dustin hit the nail on the head where he said that um, from a company perspective, some companies are not necessarily trusting of Google and Amazon. Uh, some customers aren't even, to be honest. You know, you know, people uh, privacy is very kind of a hot topic right now and and i think building trust throughout the voice ecosystem and throughout the conversational ecosystem is is hugely important so great tips there for for how you can do that from setting expectations uh within your greeting and within your marketing to listening uh properly uh, to be able to understand when people are trying to switch tasks and change the mission and and listening out for stuff that you can't support and anticipating what people might want to do that you might not necessarily be able to cater for right then and and getting the conversation back on track uh, echoing back so that's it's almost, it's almost like convers- it's almost like confirmations rather isn't it confirming that you've heard the right thing confirming that you are just about to perform the right task and then within your response you can use things to build trust within your responses in a similar way that that google and amazon do when they say here's something i found from uh, wikipedia or from recipedia or whatever you can do the exact same thing by showing a little bit of your work in in the response to your user and finally looking at error recovery um, being able to bring things back from an error and recover properly you know allows you to allows you to build trust um, and i think also dustin was absolutely spot on towards the end of that in terms of other things that that help build trust with conversational experiences and more importantly than anything else possibly is is just delivering on what you're supposed to do doing your job providing that utility getting the job done um, and if you do that you build trust do that over time and you sustain that trust thank you so much elaine for joining us that was an immense conversation thank you dustin for leading on this one and thank you all for listening until next time see you later